Welcome back to another edition of Strawman Trust Productions. I am your host, Johnny Strawman, and this is the unraveling of the Strawman. Before I get started, I wanted to say thank you to all of you watching this. It means a great deal to have you here, and it drives me forward to keep revealing the many secrets of commercial redemption and private law. Okay, so you hear the term all the time, and it's always spoken in some vague manner that leaves you more confused the more you learn about it. And yet, you know it's true. And so you want to know more about it. But what is it? It's like the matrix. You can't see it or hear it or touch it. Yet it is everywhere and all around you. It is the air you breathe and the invisible chains manacled to your wrists and ankles. It is the source of your poverty and the basis for your enslavement. It is real and yet totally fictitious. It is your double. Created by administrative devise at your birth with the express purpose of subjugating you and binding you in eternal servitude to Uncle Scam and his corporation, United States. It is the straw man. The straw man is a transmitting utility, like power lines and railroad tracks or public roads and easements, establishing a legal nexus between you and Uncle Scam. The straw man is a front, a corporate fiction which is utilized to make it seem like it is you. Yet it is something totally different, a doppelganger. It is an ens legis or creature of law. This creature is the very person spoken of in statutes and codes and rules written by the reptilian legislators and senators of the de facto states and of the federal zone headquartered at Washington, D.C. The straw man is an employee and franchisee of the corporation United States and is presumed to be a permanent resident of the federal zone. The straw man is a person a resident and a taxpayer, and it is liable for all fees, fines, taxes, and assessments levied against you. The straw man is a citizen of the United States and is presumed to have pledged all of your property and rights to the bankruptcy reorganization of the corporation United States by and through its agents, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the 73rd Congress in 1933. Specifically, due to H.J.R. 192 and the abrogation of the Gold Clause of the United States Constitution at Article 1, Section 10, all property rights have been suspended to reflect that all ownership is in the state and that you hold title in interest only as mere user. This is why your property can be taken from you for not paying taxes and registration fees and insurance premiums. When you were born, your parents were bamboozled by the agents of Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson and Johnson into applying for a birth certificate and a social security number. Through this process, they signed you over to the state. This entire scheme was devised by Franklin Roosevelt in order to lock us into obligation to the government through adhesion contracts and by tacit agreement. Your parents were lied to and told that they needed to register your birth to ensure you had a legally protected existence. That was a lie. Instead, what they did is they gave up ownership of your baby. You gave up ownership of your baby, rather, and helped facilitate the creation of the straw man. The registering of a baby's birth passes ownership of the baby to the local authority or registrar, which allows that authority to take the child away from the parents if it should ever decide to do so. This applies until the child reaches the age of majority, at which point he or she can now simply be proclaimed of unsound mind and in all and with all dealings, which is in fact why agents always write an X in front of the signature line. In law, that X represents that the signer is incompetent to follow the process on his or her own and must thus be represented. None of this is lawful, but after the birth has been registered, it most assuredly is legal. Remember, lawful refers to the common and organic law of the land, while legal refers to a colorable, fictitious system of codes devised by man to subdue man. When the birth of a child is registered, the straw man or strawminius homo in legalese is created. Black's Law Dictionary First Edition does not define the English word straw man specifically, but rather defines only its legalese counterpart, which is strawminius homo, meaning literally straw man. I know that sounds funny, but it has nothing to do with sexual orientation, I assure you. In 1891, Henry Campbell Black defined the straw man as, quote, a man of straw, one of no substance put forward as bail or surety, unquote. In property law, a straw man would be the person whom a grantor transfers land to for some reason, sometimes known as a front, for the sole purpose of concealing the true owner. 
sometimes even for, pur for purposes that would otherwise be illegal. This creature is established by Uncle Scam with the hope that as we grow up, we will be fooled into believing that we are actually the straw man and in turn stand as surety for all manner of fraudulent liabilities devised by our reptilian overlords for their own unjust enrichment. How does Uncle Scam do this? He addresses you always in all capital letters. The all caps format is a style not covered in the government manual on styles, which lists all the ways courts and agencies can address people. In nearly 60 different versions, all caps is not mentioned a single time. In fact, there are only two types of things that can be styled in all caps, corporations and dead entities. Well, which one are you? If the answer is neither, then why are they styling your name in all caps? Because they're addressing a corporate fiction and they are operating under the legal presumption that you are dead and lost at sea. You think I'm joking? In the year of the common era, 1,666, pay no mind to the apparently random 666 sequence in there. I'm sure it's coincidental. But in 1,666 of the common era, the SESTA KV Trust Act was passed in England as, quote, an act for redress of inconveniences by want of proof of the deceases of persons beyond the seas or absenting themselves upon whose lives estates do depend, unquote. If you pay attention to acts in America, you'll see that Congress uses the same language when writing acts right here at home. This is because we're still under the dominion of the crown of England. Now, during the time of the bubonic or black plague and the great fires of London, the reptilians in parliament enacted the Sesta KV Trust Act of 1666. The act contained several key provisions that shaped its legal sig significance then and that continues to shape it everywhere on this earth to this very day. Firstly, it devised the concept of legally dead, allowing the state to declare individuals deceased if they did not provide proof of existence after seven years of absence. This, presum this presumption of death had profound implications for property rights as it enabled the Crown to administer missing persons estates during their absence, and it allowed it to escheat or unlawfully convert the property to its own use. The act also subtly placed the burden of proof on the individual rather than the state, contrary to legal conventions. As today, government instigated the onslaught of those catastrophic events and then capitalized on them by devising a legal framework to deprive its subjects of their own property. The Sesta KV Trust Act is still law in England to this very day, even though the English government claims it doesn't actually affect anyone. Why not repeal it then? There are certainly petitions in play right now that are being completely ignored by Parliament. Seems strange to keep a law on the books that affects nothing and no one. The situation is no different in America. With the passing of the Social Security Act of 1935, the 32nd president of the corporation, Franklin Roosevelt, signed the straw man account into law, stating that he intended for there to be a system that would obligate its citizens to Uncle Scam from birth to death by luring them into a benefits program that would constitute a waiver of their otherwise unalienable creator endowed rights to be free from government intrusion and tyranny. The act created a mechanism by which Uncle Scam can force you to pay for insurance you may never need or use, FICA, tax you to use an unconstitutional money system, fiat Federal Reserve notes, inflict penalties on you for not conforming to frivolous and unconstitutional administrative regulations, codes, and statutes and put you in prison for victimless crimes, so-called crimes against the state, such as traffic infractions, noise and fire ordinance violations, and a whole host of other ludicrous rules instituted to enslave you and empower the reptilian families who rule the world. What the Sesta KV Trust Act did or has done is create a scenario wherein all of us are presumed to be dead entities lost at sea. As such, Uncle Scam gets to treat us as creatures devoid of rights and extend us mere privileges and civil liberties if and when to do so is necessary for appearances, so as not to frighten or even arouse the suspicion of the sheep at large. All of the obligations and assessments and taxes levied are all done so through the straw man. Driver's license, marriage license fees, income tax and inheritance tax, capital gains and gas tax, import tax and sales tax, convenience tax and sin tax, carbon tax and green tax. Next, there will most certainly be an equity tax, a social justice tax, 
a gender studies and equality act and tax and more. That is precisely the purpose for creating the straw man. And then the SESTIC A trust is set up to embezzle your funds to the coffers of the state and federal government. Simply put, when you were born, the state became the recipient of your future energy output via your birth certificate as a security title document, which the state converted into a bond to be sold on the open market to finance the government's day-to-day -day expenses and to service the federal debt. The holder of that birth certificate bond is the secured party entitled to receive all the benefits of your future energy output. That energy is measured in Federal Reserve notes. The bondholder owns quite literally the results of everything you do. Each and every person has a mirror image entity that represents this energy output. This mirror image is the straw man <clears throat> and is often called the nom de guerre or war name as we are all considered enemy combatants to our reptilian overlords in accordance with the Trading with the Enemies Act of 1917, which has evolved considerably over the years. So every time you sign your name to a document, you're acknowledging that you exist in a surety relationship with the straw man. <clears throat> Excuse me. As we have said, for the state to have control over something, it must have first created it. This concept is at the heart of natural law, that he who creates something controls it. The state has created the fictitious identity straw man to mirror the living man. It offers benefits to the fictitious identity, and if the living man accepts the benefits without protest, he accepts the state's control over him, as well as over his fictitious straw man. Anytime the state creates an identity document, such as an employee badge or driver's license or a passport, it contains certain elements that make its creation state-ordained. The first element, as we have said, is the name itself. The name is always spelled in all capital letters. You were never taught in school to spell your name this way because to do so would be improper English. In law, spelling a word contrary to the rules of English creates a legal fiction and operates under the dominion of legalese. Legalese is a form of Latin that takes regular words and converts them into cryptic words with ever-changing and highly colorable meanings, meanings that are often strikingly different from the ordinary meaning of the word. Why would anyone want to change the meaning of regular words if not to trick regular people? So it is that when you accept improper spelling, you are actually accepting an entirely new name, a name given to your mirror image straw man by the state at your birth. The second element of the fictitious identity is the birth date itself. While your parents may have been told, or rather it may have told you, and a birth certificate may say so, you can never testify as to the day you were born. Maybe you were never even born at all. How can you know? Maybe you were woven out of thin air. It's something you can't possibly remember or know for yourself, and therefore you can't stand witness to the alleged event. This is yet another hustle by Uncle Scam. Think about it. Every time a state employee or state agency requires you to give your date of birth and sign under oath to the veracity of your statements, you're perjuring yourself. <coughs> This date on the identification document is not about the date of your birth at all, but the date of your birth and docking of your straw man. You're really testifying that the straw man exists and that you're the surety standing for the straw man and all of its actions and inactions. State and federal benefits are only available to the straw man and he is the actual citizen of the state. Things are deliberately structured this way in order to confuse the average man into believing he is something he is not, a person. If you've not already seen our video titled The Official State Office of Person, be sure to watch it directly after this video so you can be completely up to date with the information being provided here. For our purposes here, however, suffice it to say that a person is not a real flesh and blood man or woman. A person is nothing more than a mask, like a persona put together in order to mask the real person underneath. Whether it's Terry Hogan putting on his persona as Hulk Hogan, or Randy Poffo wearing his mask as Macho Man Randy Savage, the persona is nothing more than a role created and utilized for the purpose of putting forth a front as a means of doing business, whether legitimate or otherwise. As it relates to Uncle Scam and the Corporation of the United States, a person is nothing more than a status or a condition and not a flesh and blood man or woman. The straw man, as the all capital letters version of your name, is also an idem sonans. That is to say, it is a term that sounds like a word that it is not. For example, the all caps version of your name sounds the same as your real name. This is intentional, of course. 
The law specifically recognizes this sort of situation. When a name that is material to the state is wrongly spelled, it is sufficient, nevertheless, if it be an idem sonans. Remember, when spoken aloud, your real name and the all capital letters version of your name sound the same. Yet in writing, they are easily distinguishable. In kind, it is just as easy to distinguish between the nation and the state. For example, the state of the United States is a fiction. Thus, the state that is the counterpart to the nation name of the United States is the nation state, called the United States, and appears correctly on printed documents. People are not so careful when writing these names as they seldom know that there is a difference between the two. Often, a government official will work for both the nation and the state, and his titles will reflect this. For example, the United States Treasury Secretary is also the all capital letters Secretary of the Treasury of the United States. These are two separate and distinct titles. Keep in mind the word of means belonging to, like of Mali or O'Malley, or O'Brien, meaning of Brian. This distinction is critical to the straw man mystery. The United States, as we know it today, is a military democracy corporation which usurped the organic republic and supplanted its de jure governance with a de facto rule of law. Only corporations can deal with corporations. And so the corporation in the United States created the corporation straw man. So what does it mean that we have a straw man? Or better yet, how can we get control of this rogue straw man and convert it to our use? And if we are not corporations, then what laws are we obligated to observe? Can we just run around like marauders doing whatever we please, whenever we please? To properly delve into this concept, we must overstand the bifurcation and its two systems of law, common law and private law. Common law is law by execution. That is to say, law that was established over long periods of time and in accordance with local custom. Common law is the basis for Roman civil law, which is in turn the basis for statutory law in America. In this form, the common law is statutory law by execution, meaning it must have public agreement. In common use, these laws carry a public liability for their usage. Such liabilities include fines, fees, penalties, assessments, and all other forms of property confiscation Implemented by, implemented by the Corporation of the United States in the name of public good. Common law by execution is not true common law, but rather colorable codified law sourced from the true common law. Common law by execution is modern case law, interpreting the codes passed by corrupt politicians for gain. The Corporation of the United States has both common stock and preferred stock. The common stock is comprised of the citizen, employee, franchisee, of the corporation United States, while the private stock is comprised of flesh and blood men and women who enjoy inalienable God-given rights. In order for the government to regulate its common stock, who are really its consumers and employees, it has taken an assumed tax exemption priority of the individuals which are using the industrial goods and services of the nation. Now, this is a sleight of hand trick, however, since HJR 192 was supposed to protect the people from the devastation that would follow the confiscation of the nation's gold. Instead of giving us our exemptions, Uncle Scam, through his agent Franklin Roosevelt, made it so that by partaking of the industrial products, there would also be a tax collected, allegedly, to keep track, or rather, uh, to keep record of all the industrial energy usage and track common stock or public funds. These funds have a public liability because they represent the energy. Money is the receptacle of our labor and is thus evidence of the transfer of energy that must be regulated. Make no mistake, we volunteer to pay taxes by our use of industrial goods and services, which is why it is a voluntary tax system. If you don't use any of the industrial goods, then there are no taxes. In order to use the industrial goods and services without the requirement of taxes, we must accept the charges and direct them back to the government, and thereby we lend our tax exemption priority to the government to discharge the public liability. This exchange gives us employer status and thus inalienable rights, hence the preferred stock, which then allows us to enjoy all the goods and services we choose at will. The common law evolved from the Old Testament and our private law, inalienable rights come from the earth and from nature. Realize all public law is execution of law, whereas all private law is international law. Remember, an individual can only fulfill it voluntarily by operation of law. The operation of law can only operate when no malice or vindictive harm is intended 
and is based upon the conscience of those charged to uphold it. It is spiritual law. Indeed, this is the source of true non-reptilian ecclesiastical law. To sum it up then, with common law rights, constitutional rights, we are considered by the IRS to be employees of the federal zone or non-resident aliens. With our unalienable rights, we volunteered into the federal zone with our priority exchange for the tax exemption, and therefore, we are now the employer. Common law is unto death. It cannot give eternal life since it operates only by execution, death, to transfer the energy through the principle. Private law, on the other hand, operation of law is unto life because it is done through acceptance, acceptance of the charges of a contract, acceptance of other people and other thought process and paradigm. Through acceptance, public liability, execution is offset, giving life or grace. It does not require the death of the principle to redeem. The energy is transferred not through the principle, but by the principle as grantor and settler. The mirror image is referred to in the public system as a straw man. This is what was created by the registration of your birth certificate. By Uncle Scam's calculation, this is a necessary evil in as much as the corporation United States needed to provide for our needs by the creation of an industrial bond to provide the goods and services for our lives. This was done in a public form and it carries a public liability and it must have an execution, a death, in order for it to be paid off in the public system. Should the individual accept this bond for value, it then loses its public liability as the individual has used his tax exemption to allow it to pass through him and not carry this public liability. When public laws are passed, these laws are intended to regulate industrial society and commercial activities and the commercial activities they affect. Public law, which has been done away with by the bankruptcy of the corporation in the United States, is regulated by public policy now. Whenever an infraction of public policy occurs, it is charged against a straw man. And since most individuals are not aware of their straw man, they believe it is charged against them as an individual. They try to use public law, argument of facts, to deny these charges. When you instead accept these charges, there is no controversy and you become the holder in due course. The charges become your private property which cannot be regulated in the commercial zone. When you accept your birth certificate for value, you become holder of the industrial bond it created. And it is now held for the public's benefit and for yours. Only now the public liability is no longer attached to the bond or to the straw man. And finally, the straw man now belongs to you. Now, if you want to learn how to capture the straw man specifically, be sure to watch our SPC 101 playlist and we'll see you next time. But in the meantime, stay tuned, stay sovereign, and do not consent.